right. Hello, everyone. Um, it is new, so I think we are going to get started. Um, I see a lot of people joining in right now. Thank you again for um, being here with us today on this rainy Wednesday. Um, we are, for our, for our most recent installment of our quarterly human trafficking prevention project um, webinar series. My name is Heather Hyman, and I'm the project manager of the Human Trafficking Prevention Project at Maryland Volunteer Lawyer Service. And I'm here with my colleagues, the director of the Human Trafficking Prevention Project, Jessica Emerson. Good morning, everybody. As well as our special guest presenter today, Chris Sweeney, who manages MVLS's Workforce Development Program. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be here. So I think we're going to jump in because we have a lot of interesting things to cover today. Um, this webinar is being recorded and we will be putting a PDF of the slides up on the HTPP website um, afterwards. So don't worry about practically taking notes. You'll be able to access all of this information later. Um, and the webinar is going to be in two parts. Um, first, I'm going to give it to Jess to talk a little bit about expungement and some of the, the changes that are occurring in expungement law here in Maryland. And then we'll switch over to Chris, who will be talking about some of the um, recent changes that have impacted how people can access their criminal records um, and some things to expect upcoming and give some advice and some tips for helping people determine their records and, and resources if they would like to get help with criminal record relief. Um, so yeah, we're excited to talk. We will be um, monitoring the chat and the questions and answers. If you have any questions, please feel free to chime in. Um, otherwise, we'll get started. Great. Okay. Now, am I allowed to actually control things? Yes, you have. Been okay, there control. we go. <laughs> all right. So this is, um, first of all, actually, I should have said good afternoon, everyone. Um, <laughs> again, I'm just, <laughs> good morning, good afternoon. Um, my, again, my name is Jessica Emerson, and I direct the Human Trafficking Prevention Project at the University of Baltimore School of Law. Um, this beginning part is really going to be a, an expungement re refresher. So if, if this is, you know, work that you have done on a regular basis, it might be a little repetitive to you, but we want to make sure that folks kind of have the, you know, a global understanding of what expungement is and why it's important before we move into the changes and most importantly, how um, you can assist your clients in figuring out what is on their criminal record. So what is expungement and why is it important? The definition is simply the removal of police and court records from public inspection. Um, that's on Maryland Judiciary Case Search, on the Criminal Justice criminal justice information system, et cetera. Um, those police and court records are removed from the public's ability to get to them um, once things are expunged. So what can be expunged? Uh, records of a criminal or incarcerable traffic offense. And what that means is a traffic offense for which you may not have been jailed, but for which you could have been jailed. Uh, there's also automatic expungement of non-incarcerable traffic offenses, but we're not going to get into that today. So why is expungement crucial? Um, simply because the disposition of many criminal charges is completely publicly available, even if the case didn't result in a conviction. So when you are arrested, that information becomes public record. And even if that case was not a conviction, it still may be publicly available, although Chris is going to explain how that's changed a little bit. Um, and excitingly, disclosure of expunged or shielded charges are not required on a job application or during interviews. Um, I'm sorry, just one second. It is raining so loudly that I can actually hear the rain, and I'm worried that people can hear that as well. So let me just close my window. I didn't realize it was getting so loud. Okay, yeah, there's much pouring out. Sorry. It's pour <laughs> I know I was like, I can't hear myself think. Um, okay, so background checks and criminal records. Like I said, every arrest, regardless of whether it leads to a formal court case, is a matter of public record. Most will show up on background checks and on case search, which is as easily as Googling case search and you go right on there. Criminal records um, may impact... Ooh, Sorry. What's happened? <laughs> I have control. Stop messing around over there. <laughs> I see Chris, Chris, my she, finger on the keyboard and everything, everything gets lost. She really is the overlord of the <laughs> webinar. Um, so criminal records, as you've heard Heather and I say ad nauseum, may impact getting a job, uh, an apartment, custody of uh, a child, a loan, credit, etc. 
Um, I updated some of these numbers. If you've seen us present on, you know, kind of criminal record relief 101, you've seen this information, but the numbers have, uh, I, I actually updated them and they're a little more severe than they were even the last couple of times that we did this. So upwards of 90% of employers run some sort of background check during the hiring process. There's also approximately 32,000 laws that are specific to occupational licensing and business licenses that have to do with whether or not you have a criminal record. Um, and there's actually an inventory if you want to search by state or by type of conviction or by occupation. Um, if you look at the bottom, you'll see the ABA National Inventory of Collateral Consequences of Conviction. That's publicly available. That's where I got this information. 32,000 laws that are specific to having a criminal record, the most heavily, heavily licensed of which are healthcare and education. And if we're talking um, about kind of intersections with gender and gender identity, healthcare and education are uh, pretty heavily sought after by female identified people. Um, public housing authorities, owners of federally assisted public housing and private landlords, all generally screen for criminal records and having a criminal record can um, be the determining factor of whether or not you get into public housing or into housing in general or get kicked out of public housing and housing in general. Um, criminal records also factor into child custody and visitation, uh, into immigration, into benefits, and just again, re this is all people, right? This is anyone with a criminal record, but we wanna make sure since we know who our audience is that we refocus on survivors of trafficking, um, having a criminal record and having it impact all of these things greatly impacts a survivor's ability to heal and to avoid continued ex exploitation, right? Because if folks can't get safe housing, if they can't get uh, employment in the, you know, the mainstream economy, the underground economy ain't going nowhere. And they're always going to be able to go back to that, which is where, um, you know, wisely uh, <laughs> exploiters are lurking to try to take advantage of people's uh, vulnerabilities. And Jess, before you jump to the next slide, yes. just, just I mean, oh. sorry. <laughs> You know, it's it's interesting. I mean, in the three years I've worked with HTPP, we've seen this in some other like very insidious ways, how criminal records can impact survivors. I just wanted to share one anecdote um, yeah. for all the advocates that are watching. You know, I've been working with a survivor who um, wasn't able to go on any uh, field trips or volunteer yeah. at her child's school because of her criminal record, um, because here in Baltimore City, um, and I'm sure at other school districts throughout the state, you have to go and get a background check done and get your fingerprints taken before you can go and volunteer in the school. And so there's there's such a myriad of ways that these criminal records can impact survivors and anyone else that's you know that's that has one. Um, and sometimes it's 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 not even something like employment or or you know housing. It's right. just the ability to participate in activities with their kids. So we all it's, need to be on the lookout for this. But yeah, the ability to participate fully in your own life. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, those of you who know me know that I believe that no one <laughs> should have this much of an impact on them being able to live their lives. But, um, you know, based on, on based on criminal records alone, um, but for survivors, this is just a, a, a double whammy. And it shows how the criminal legal system and the things that are associated with the criminal legal system continue to victimize survivors long after um, their trafficking situation has ended. All right, so what can be expunged and what are the waiting periods? Just giving you kind of a general background on this. Um, obviously, we wouldn't necessarily force you um, to do these calculations your, yourselves, but just so that you're generally aware of what the waiting periods are for all non-convictions, right? So cases that result in a dismissal, um, which is when the judge dismisses the case, and an acquittal, which is a finding of not guilty. Um, a, oh, we have, a, oh, I'm sorry, an acquittal, finding of not guilty, no pros, um, are eligible to be expunged immediately, okay? Those are eligible to be expunged the second the judge's gavel goes down. However, if you're filing within three years of the closing of the case, the petitioner would also need to sign a waiver of liability stating that they won't sue the police department um, and associated entities relating to that arrest in particular. Um, for stats, you have to wait three solid years after, again, the closing of the case. And for probation before judgment, there is a three-year waiting, pe uh, three waiting period or 
completion of the probation, whichever is longer. So if there's no necessary, necessarily any, um, any probation time, that three year waiting period um, starts the moment that the judge's gavel goes down. But if they have a year's worth of probation, that three year waiting period does not begin until that probation is complete. Um, there's also a little caveat with PBJs. If there is a subsequent conviction within three years of the entry of the PBJ, uh, the PBJ is no longer eligible for expungement unless and until that subsequent conviction is. Um, and then just generally speaking, PBJs for DUIs cannot be expunged under any circumstances. Um, adult criminal charges that were transferred to, ju transferred to juvenile court, those are immediately expungable. Convictions for nuisance crimes. And again, I sound like a broken record. I like to put, the, put that in quotations because you'll notice that urinating in public, panhandling, drinking alcohol in public, vagrancy, loitering, um, using transit without payment, sleeping in public. Many of these things are um, things that people who are experiencing homelessness need to do to live. And calling them a nuisance crime is an indication that the individual who came up with that name finds people who are experiencing homelessness to be a nuisance rather than someone who deserves support and assistance. So that's just my little soapbox. But generally speaking, these quote unquote nuisance crimes, um, you can file for expungement three years after conviction or the end of the sentence, whichever is longer. If there is a finding of not someone being not criminally responsible for trespass, for telephone misuse, or disturbing the peace, those are immediately expungible. And convictions for crimes that are no longer a crime are immediately expungible. Now, this stemmed from uh, the, the steps that the state has taken over the last five, six years to slowly decriminalize small amounts of marijuana. Um, and so that essentially... Um, uh, possession of a small amount of marijuana was decriminalized. It was considered a crime that was no longer a crime. And then we have kind of moved from there to include things like consensual sodomy, gaming, um, cards and dice, public consumption, open container, um, possession of a revoked or canceled or suspended license. Those things are immediately expungible. And all convictions for marijuana possession um, are now expungible four years from the date of conviction or completion of the sentence, including probation. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I see there's a note in the chat. Um, someone put some important information um, about if, if you're helping someone get expungements who um, does not have stable status here in the United States, um, noting that you need to get certified copies of the entire file associated with the charges, the convictions, and the expungement proceedings. Um, and that's a note that we're going to bring up later because it is a more complicated endeavor with certain right. risks and considerations if the individual doesn't have stable status. Um, and so we, we very much can encourage people to consult right. with an immigration attorney. I was going to say the, the one that thing that I, that, I, that I disagree with about that is that if you decide to expunge their record, please get. No, if you decide to expunge their record, consult an immigration attorney. Don't act without speaking with yes. an immigration attorney yes. first. That's the only yes. thing that I disagree with about that. I'm not following any directions unless they're <laughs> given to me by an immigration attorney. <laughs> um, so in, was it 2017, Chris, that the Justice Reinvestment, or 2016, when the Justice Reinvestment Act passed? Because it, it I, I think 17. it was 2017. And then a year later, a provision of the Justice Reinvestment Act went into effect that made a whole host of convictions eligible for expungement. And again, broken record, the majority <laughs> of the convictions that are eligible really do not affect our clients. Um, they are very, quote unquote, white collar type uh, convictions. Um, and again, I think that shows the mindset of what's important in terms of um, allowing people to clear up their records. <laughs> that being said, uh, here's a list of uh, the most relevant, we think, uh, criminal charges or convictions that are eligible to be expunged under the Justice Reinvestment Act. Um, at first, it was only misdemeanor crimes, but you'll see since 2016, five additional felonies have been added, uh, possession with intent to distribute, uh, first, second, and third degree burglary with certain caveats, and felony theft. 
Um, and that it was interesting that um, first, second, and third degree burglary are eligible for expungement, but fourth degree burglary, which is essentially squatting, which a lot of our clients have on their records, that was just left out. And so that was a mistake that was fixed last legislative session. So as of 10 1, um, fourth degree burglary and driving with a suspended license will be added. And I don't usually say this in my presentations, but I heard Chris say it. And I think it's really important to note that driving with a suspended license, um, having that added as far as a, a conviction that is uh, eligible to be expunged, that really helps with the subsequent conviction um, piece as far as PBJs and the like, because and this incarcerable tra traffic offense would count against you in a lot of instances when it comes to expungement. So it's nice that that is actually on the list again. Mm -hmm. um, this list is all well and good. The wait times are ridiculous. OK, for <laughs> for majority of the charges on here, you have to wait 10 full years after the conviction, after completing any assigned parole, probation or mandatory supervision. Um, and again, for our clients that are, for instance, uh, unstably housed, it can be hard to keep up with probation officers and court dates. And so you might see someone or have uh, be working with someone who violates probation or, you know, over and over and over again. And that can go on for years. And that 10 year waiting period does not even start until everything with regard to the case is done with, over and done with. For second degree assault and all eligible fe felonies or any crime that's related to an incident of domestic violence, there's a 15 year wait. Um, and there's also a subsequent conviction rule. So after all that, you know, you finally get that 10 or 15 year clock running. If there is a subsequent conviction during that wait time, during that 10 or 15 years, um, sorry, I, these, I wish these chats wouldn't be popping up, so I, <laughs> I'm interrupting my train of thought. Um, so during that 10 or 15 year waiting period, if there is a subsequent conviction, then that expungible, previously expungible conviction uh, is no longer eligible for expungement unless and until that additional conviction um, is uh, eligible. And for, you know, clients that are kind of chronically systems involved, live in incredibly heavily policed areas um, who have a different skin tone than me, they may really struggle with, um, you know, arrests and interactions and intersection with the criminal legal system um, that are a lot of times beyond their control. So that subsequent conviction uh, can be really problematic. All right, some red flag issues for expungement. If your client is not a U.S. citizen, we said before, use caution. Um, as the person in the chat stated this can create discrepancies between state and federal records and we really recommend like if we're doing the immigration excuse me the immigration the expungement we're going to recommend consulting an immigration attorney before we would ever take on a case like that um, for private third-party businesses so essentially someone can just pay a private company to do a background check um, and what they do essentially is they just scrape data from the interwebs and so they may pull your data before your record has been expunged and then keep that information in their system. And they generally do not and cannot be forced to update their information to remove items. So there, there may be very inaccurate background checks coming back if those third party businesses pulled data before you know, your expungement was uh, successful. We also do a lot of the time for our clients who um, have criminal records in multiple states, we'll do a federal background check. And those can be inaccurate as well. They can contain cases that are expunged at the state level as well as other inaccurate information because the federal database gets filled in by the states. And if the states contribute inaccurate information, then um, the federal database, the federal background check can be inaccurate as well. Um, so that's just kind of some basic information on expungement. Do we have any questions that are relevant to general expungement issues before we turn it over to Chris? Yeah, there was one, and it was um, it was answered by Chris. Um, uh, one of our participants was oh, asking great. if there's any subsequent um, conviction, or does it have to be a subsequent conviction of the same type of offense that can invoke that rule where it kicks anything the at all down? Yeah, and that's the problem. Like you know, we've worked with clients. I mean, I've worked with clients that have had their their potential to expunge cases has been kicked back by thirty years sometimes yep. since the Me initial. Too. Um, offense because they keep, you know, it's set, six years will go by, seven years will go by, and then they're arrested and convicted of something else, and it just keeps piling up. And, um, you know, we also see it as when people are going through 
cycles of, of substance use or, or just yep. grappling with a, a, a whole different um, poverty, you know, homelessness, yeah, all of those things can land somebody. you in jail. Yep. And it's, it's really, it's a shame because then when an individual is ready and wants to address their record, it can, it can make it, you know, impossible to even address things that occurred 30 years ago, um, let alone things that occurred recently. Right. And then just kind of considering the emotional impact of that on someone. So I've, you know, I've waited, I know I have to wait, I've waited eight years. Um, I'm suddenly experiencing uh, a period of homelessness and I get busted for loiter, you know, for vagrancy or for uh, sleeping in an abandoned building. And now all of the time that I spent um, is for naught essentially with regard to expungement and how, you know, what is the impact uh, of, on someone emotionally at, uh, you know, ha having had an experience like that, especially a survivor who is seeking to escape um, perhaps a conviction that they, you know, they were forced to engage in, criminal activity they were forced to engage in. We have one more question. Um, I'll just throw it out to the to my colleagues. Um, is if the credit reporting agency continues to report information after a consumer notifies them that a record has been expunged, could that be a violation of the Fair Credit Reporting Act? I that's an that's a question for Amy, and we can yeah, follow that's up. a question uh, for one of our consumer attorneys, <laughs> Chris. Do you know? Yeah, that's very different than a background check company not doing their due diligence. Um, as far as a credit reporting agency, I I don't know mm -hmm. uh, unless you do, Chris. I don't know for sure if reporting the existence of the case would be a violation. Uh, one thing that I would add is that there could be a difference between the credit reporting agency reporting a debt that resulted from the case, such as a fine that went to like a central collections agency gotcha. or a restitution mm -hmm. judgment. Um, and those debts are often separate cases from the criminal case. So the criminal case getting expunged, there could be a like a, a restitution judgment that is a separate civil matter that could still show up um, in that context. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. And I mean, I think that goes to the second point on this, um, this slide that, you know, there's lots of different agencies that are scraping data and just because something is expunged doesn't necessarily mean that the background check or the credit check or whatever uh, a landlord or an employer or someone is going to be using to look up information on an individual, it's, it's not necessarily going to be updated. And that's, again, the reason to keep all copies of all the records, copies of expungement orders, um, and to just prepare any client you're working with to talk frankly about these things if they get brought up, even if something is expunged. It's unfortunate, but that's just, there's too much data so freely available. And I would also say that if you believe that something like that is on a credit report that shouldn't be, then, um, you know, I would recommend helping out with a, a dispute to the agency that if you have a reason to believe that it really should not be showing up anymore. Mm -hmm. And MVLS is available to provide consultations on that, um, you know, with a lot of the HTTP clients that we have, and as well as just clients coming generally to MVLS, and we have a great consumer rights team um, and financial stabilization team that is able to assist with any of these questions. And, you know, we've, as part of the job that, that, that we do, you know, I'm happy to help clients access their credit reports, review credit reports, answer questions, and see if there might be assistance we can provide, um, or at least give them some guidance or an advocate guidance as to how to contest something like that. All right, I think we are now going to be Turning it over to Chris to talk about some of the recent changes that have happened to Maryland expungement law and the process by which people get expungements and then talk a little bit about criminal records um, and some of the changes that have occurred to how we might access those records here in Maryland. Chris, I will give you control of the presentation. Okay. Thanks. So, yeah. Um, this year, there were some pretty substantial changes that went into effect uh, regarding how criminal records are displayed in the court's public database. So I'm going to be talking about what that looks like and how that affects doing expungements. Um, this information doesn't affect the, the explanation that Jess gave about what can and cannot be expunged. Um, this is relevant really to just where the records 
can be found. Um, but starting off with automatic expungement, um, this is something that's very important to be aware of. It's actually not going to become super relevant until three years from now, so uh, fall of 2024. Uh, but what you should be aware of is that automatic expungement did pass uh, the legislature this year. And what's going to happen is that cases where all of the charges did not result in a conviction, um, and specifically all of the charges resulted in a null prost, aka a dropped charge, uh, an acquittal, not guilty, uh, or a dismissal, um, those cases will automatically be expunged after three years from the disposition date. Um, a person who receives that outcome in their case will still have the right to file an expungement according to all of the rules that just went over. Um, so it would still be advisable to expunge the case if you can. Um, and of course, if it's before three years, they would still have to submit the liability waiver, um, agreeing not to bring a claim against the state or the police or anyone involved in the case. This is not going to apply to steps or probations before judgment. So that will still have to be expunged manually, so to speak. Um, and it's also not getting around uh, what we call the unit rule. So if there is one charge in a particular case that does not fall within uh, these rules, so a guilty uh, or a stat or a PBJ, that means that the case overall is not going to be automatically expunged. Uh, this is not going to affect any cases that have already happened. This is going into effect October 1st of this year, so very soon. Um, but any case that has already occurred is not going to be automatically expunged as a result of this new law. Um, but we are going to find out shortly here that a lot of these cases that I'm speaking of that are subject to automatic expungement are actually going to be hidden uh, from the case search website. So I'm going to be talking about that shortly. And Chris, I, I just want to, again, just hammer this point in. Automatic expungement does not impact anything that happens on September 30th or earlier. <laughs> so if your client has a case that, you know, for all intents and purposes, would have been automatically expunged, it's not, and it didn't happen October 1st or later, it's not going to happen. So uh, I, I've just heard a lot of, just because these are big changes, there's a lot of, con understandably, a lot of confusion about it. I mean, it took us a while to just like wrap our heads around this. Um, it's, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, well, eventually it'll be automatically expunged because they passed that automatic expungement law. That is not true, right? We still have to um, actually petition to expunge anything that happened September 30th or earlier even if it's not visible on case search, which is the next thing that Chris is gonna get into. So just wanna make sure people don't get that confused because that's the kind of, I had to like make that change in my brain. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So talking about Maryland Judiciary Case Search, this is the website that attorneys have traditionally used that really just anyone who wanted to look at their own case may have used or be familiar with, or anyone who has helped out anyone with searching for public records. Um, this is uh, kind of the first stop in looking up someone's cases online. And this has been the, the uh, just the court's website there um, to house public records. Um, it's searchable by name. It's, it's pretty easy to sort by case type, date of birth, and it's still going to be a pretty helpful tool in finding cases on someone's records because there are still going to be plenty of records out there with convictions, steps, PBJs. Um, it 
is noteworthy that there can be incorrect information on case search. Um, if someone does not have a super common name, there are often misspellings. Um, someone, there could be typos in dates of birth where there's one character off. Um, there can be missing information even before this new law went into effect. So it's important to recognize that uh, a cert, an in-depth search on case search may require being aware of possible common misspellings or looking at dates of birth that are very similar to the person uh, who you're looking for. And just to, if, if I can just complain about one thing, because I love uh -huh. to do that. Um, the, <laughs> the thing about case search that annoys me the most is that there, I, I just started working with a new client who has like 14 AKAs, like also known as, because they put an E on the end of her last name in one and they didn't in another. They used her middle name in one and not the other. They put an E on the end of her middle name in one and not the other. And so it looks like to the, again, to the untrained eye that she has 14 different AKAs and that, that that's really shady. And that's just one of the many things that annoys me about case search. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a really important point and something that I've been told by um, the state's attorney's office is that even if an AKA goes into the system by accident, like the clerk entering the information typed the person's middle name as their first name, that just becomes like permanently attached to the person. So if they have another arrest, it just keeps coming up and they're kind of stuck with that. So talking about what case search is going to look like going forward. Um, this is something that has actually already went into effect. Um, usually uh, new, new legislation goes into effect on October 1st. This is something that actually went into effect pretty much immediately earlier uh, in the spring. And what is happening is that uh, any case that, any charge actually any criminal charge that resulted in a dismissal a not guilty or a null pros is being hidden from maryland case search uh, so this is not just cases where all of the charges resulted in that but it is actually also being applied to individual charges uh, so kind of the genesis of this was uh, an attempt to kind of get around the unit rule uh, where a lot of people advocating for for those who have criminal records have expressed that it's it's somewhat unfair to have a number of charges displayed on case search even if something uh, resulted in a guilty there could be charges that look a lot worse that were completely dropped or even found not guilty that are still showing up so this is kind of one way of getting around that level uh, of criminal records um, being found. Uh, however, it's important to note that these charges or entire cases that are disappearing from the case search website are not being expunged. So in a legal sense, uh, they still completely exist. They are still 100% a matter of public record uh, they can still be accessed through background checks like fingerprints or third party private background check companies or records requests through the courts. Um, and we're going to be getting into where else uh, these records can be found as we move forward. So, as an example uh, of what case search would look like before and after this went into effect. Um, this is an example of multiple cases on a person's record and what a case search results list look like before and after. So um, you can see on the left that represents three separate criminal cases. And in case um, X and Y, all of the charges were null prost. So because there are only one charge in each of those cases. Um, that means all of the charges are affected by this new law. So the entire case is hidden from Maryland case search. And then remaining only 
is the one case where there was a conviction. And this is an example of what case search looks like if you're looking at a single case that has multiple charges. So in this case, a person was charged with three crimes. They were found not guilty on two of them, and they were found guilty on the one charge of CDS possession. So now looking at an individual case on Maryland case search, you would see only the charge where the person was found guilty. So again, there are a number of substantial benefits, especially to people who actually are affected by having these records um, as a result of these charges and entire cases being hidden from case search. It can make it a lot harder for an employer or landlord or really just anyone to find out about these charges and uh, Obviously, many people in attendance know that there can be a number of charges on a person's record that can look daunting, can look negative, but they could not have even been a guilty. There can be certain charges that sound, just by what they're called, a lot worse than they really are, and it can create an impression of someone. Um, so those are often going to be no longer accessible on case search. Um, and then those cases that were affected by the unit rule where, say, someone had 10 charges and was only convicted of one, and maybe they were convicted of something small like trespassing and they were not convicted of something that sounds violent or, or just less desirable to have on your record. That's the sort of thing that also would be hidden from case search if there wasn't a conviction. The, Chris, um, yeah, Chris one of the... We, I actually just um, w have been working with a, a survivor for a long time and had exactly the, the kind of experience that you described. She was found in a house where there was a lot of drug activity, where there were guns, where she just, and they threw everything but the kitchen sink at everyone there. And so there's long guns, shotguns, all kinds of things, you know, that she was charged with, drug possession, possession with intent to distribute, manufacturing, um, and she actually only got a PBJ on a drug possession, right? So it's not even the yeah. conviction there. And as a long story short, there that three-year subsequent conviction rule kicked in, so we actually can't right now expunge that PBJ, or at least right now we can't. But that unit of charges looked horrible, and she did have she just was there, and it was actually her trafficker's, uh, you know, kind of stash house. And, you know, she feels a lot more comfortable with people potentially looking her up and seeing just this PBJ for drug possession than she mm -hmm. did with this whole host of, I think it was 14 different charges. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been yeah. really helpful to, to her. I've, I've had similar occasions too. There was a client that, that I was reviewing their record with and they got into an altercation and they ended up being charged with assault, but also attempted murder. And they weren't found... <laughs> guilty of those things but having that I mean that was they identified that as an incredibly huge barrier because no one's once they, they just see that charge they don't look down to the disposition they don't want any further information it's a snap judgment about the individual's character and so that's a definite benefit but again unfortunately it's not completely gone <laughs> it's just hidden on one database but it's better so, than having it available to the entire yes, public. <laughs> very true. Harm, very harm true. reduction. Yes. Harm reduction. Slow <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I think that, right, the, the people who are directly affected by having records are, are benefiting a lot from this. The challenges um, are really kind of going to be on the part of advocates or attorneys who represent people for expungement. Um, there's just going to be a bit more work to be done to actually find the records and expunge them. So to emphasize again, the cases that are being hidden from case search are not being expunged. Um, they're just being removed from that particular site. They would still exist in a fingerprint database. Uh, they would still exist completely in court records. 
um, and they would even exist on other versions of case search, which I'll talk about shortly, um, for counties in Maryland that use electronic filing, there is actually a separate case search. Uh, so those cases would still appear in there because it's not Maryland Judiciary Case Search, which is the only website affected by this law. Um, so a person who has their cases hidden from case search um, should still be aware that if they went for a job that required a fingerprint check, um, there could be things showing up on there that they might have thought were gone uh, because they're not on case search, but they haven't actually been formally expunged, uh, which is going to require uh, a legal filing uh, until automatic expungement goes into effect. So going and finding these records, um, because the ease of case search has been taken away somewhat, uh, finding the records is going to be somewhat more burdensome. So fingerprint checks are one of the best ways to actually determine a complete view of what's on someone's record. Um, this can be burdensome for our clients because you have to go in person to the facility. Um, it does cost money. It uh, can be very time consuming trying to call up a kind of bureaucratic agency and make an appointment and whatnot. Um, and of course, reliving, looking over the full record um, can be re-traumatizing and even just kind of the experience of going and being subjected to kind of like a bureaucratic process is be unpleasant at a, at a minimum. Um, they are complete in the sense of they generally should show all of the cases that are on a record. They are incomplete in the sense of for purposes of expungement or even just being aware of a complete picture of the record, the court case number is almost always missing from a fingerprint report and that the disposition of a case is often missing as well. Um, the fingerprint report kind of functions as more of an arrest record. Um, so it would show a tracking number, which the police use, that then gets linked later to a case number in the courts, and it would show arrest dates and charges, but it doesn't always show the outcomes of the charges, which are certainly necessary for determining expungement eligibility. And I've noticed since now we're in this world where instead of, you know, case search, I have to do a lot more work with the fingerprint record to, you know, itself. The way that sentence information is documented, probation, things like that, it, it's honestly, it's just really confusing. And I found it to be just inaccurate generally. And so when I'm trying to see when an expungement clock is going to start, it's, it's really mm. difficult. So case number, the disposition, absolutely. But then just when did the case actually end is hard, way harder to figure out now. Yeah. Okay, so this slide is kind of a little quiz or examples of uh, pretty much all of the things that we've been discussing so far. Um, so if, if anyone wants to, uh, to answer in the chat, uh, go ahead as I as I read through these. So the first example is Lucinda being arrested for trespassing and fourth degree burglary, and on August 29th of 2021, um, the court dismissed both charges. Um, so the first question would be: Is this going to be automatically expunged? And the second question would be. Uh, is it going to be hidden from Maryland case search? Come on, folks, do the quiz with us. <laughs> if not, Heather and I are going to have to answer. <laughs> Whoa. Wrong direction. <laughs> okay. 
Oh, technology. We've only been doing this for 18 to 20 months. You'd think we'd have this down by now. Nobody okay, guessed? so I, I suppose I'll give away the answer uh, to number one, which would be that the case will not be subject to automatic expungement because it didn't occurred before October 1st of this year. Um, but it will be hidden from Maryland case search because all of the charges were dismissed. My apologies for the earlier. I was trying to unmute myself and apparently that jumped us completely out of the PowerPoint. Fun with Zoom. <laughs> I wanted to answer, Chris, just so you know. I wanted to play with it. All right, give us uh, the next one, Chris. <laughs> Heather, Heather's got Monica's answer. <laughs> okay, so the, the next example is Monica was arrested for second degree assault and was found not guilty on October 3rd, 2021. All right, so since that is past October 1st, that should be eligible for automatic expungement since it was a not guilty. Um, and also that charge should be shielded once the final disposition is entered. That actually leads me to an interesting question. Do you have any idea when that shielding would happen, like what the time frame is post final disposition in a case? Guess we're just going to have to see. I think it's right away. It should happen immediately. I mean, mm -hmm. it. Yeah, for current cases, yeah. rather. We know that retroactively they went back and shielded. But for mm -hmm. like a case that ends today, I think it's immediate. Mm -hmm. We'll keep everyone posted as we see these cases happening. <laughs> okay, so if Sarah was arrested and charged with loitering and CDS possession, um, and convicted on October 10th, 2021 of CDS possession and the loitering charge was dropped. Okay, Whoa. I got this Go one. Uh, this case as a whole will not be automatically expunged because the loitering charge, which would normally be eligible um, for automatic expungement is linked via the unit rule with that conviction for drug possession. However, the loitering charge will be shielded from case search. Um, so only the drug possession conviction will show up. And if every, if the case is really wrapped up on October 1st, October 10th, I'm sorry, 2021, the entire unit will be eligible for expungement on October 10th, 2031, at which time both charges are eligible for expungement. Boom. <laughs> Nice. That one was that was a complicated one. Let's see. So the final example is Sid was arrested for prostitution and CDS possession. The court entered a stat on both charges on October twentieth, twenty twenty one. And I can I can give away the answer if I can take Before a turn. I <laughs> okay, so there's a stat on both charges, and stat, stats are not being subject to automatic expungement, so that would remain on SID's record permanently unless an expungement were to be filed, and it will also not be hidden from Maryland case search because it is not a null process acquittal or dismissal. But it will be eventually eligible for expungement in 2024. Correct. So I'm going to go through kind of what the steps that we've outlined in, in, in order to expunge cases and find records uh, in light of these items disappearing from Maryland case search. Uh, we still recommend beginning on Maryland case search. There should be a number of uh, cases still findable on there. If the person has convictions, stats, BBJs, and everything is pretty much the same uh, on the process and everything. Um, so you can still find the information you need to expunge those cases on case search. Um, you may find a hint of other 
cases that you need to look for on there. If, for example, you have a case that started in district court and went to circuit court and then was null prost in circuit court, you may still find the district court version on case search, which is another sort of little niche thing to, to be aware of, but I don't wanna overburden people with, with information. Um, Chris, I think it's really the way that, uh, I just want everyone listening to know that this is laid out in a particular way to help people understand that this is now, you know, case search is no longer the way it was. Um, <laughs> You know, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but essentially this should now be a layered process, right? And this is the first right. layer. Mm -hmm. um, like Chris has said, your stats are going to be your PBJs, your convictions, any active cases, but it's just really important to know you don't stop here if there's nothing on Maryland Judiciary Case Search, whereas I might have done that prior to, you know, the spring of this year. I might have stopped there. Um, and I can't do that now because I know that that's likely or potentially not accurate. Right. So the next layer uh, is going to be the fingerprint report, uh, which is commonly called a CGIS report, standing for Criminal Justice Information System. Um, I kind of went over what a fingerprint report contains and some of the pros and cons of obtaining that. Um, again, it is burdensome. Uh, MVLS is, is not making it an absolute requirement for expungement, but it because of the burden to clients, but it is going to be helpful um, if you are able to suggest to a client uh, that this be obtained. Um, the main office is located on Reisterstown Road uh, in the northwest corner of the city, um, somewhat near the uh, Wabash Courthouse, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a, a fee required. Um, but this is just kind of another layer to the process of kind of coming in at all angles and trying to find records anywhere that they might be found. And a quick note with regards to both um, the CGIS report and an FBI background check, which Chris will talk about, um, even, you know, as there are fees to get these records, um, well, generally MVLS does not have funds to give clients to, um, for them to go get their records. We do have some money through the, the HTPP project. Um, so there is an option for all the advocates working with survivors or with anti-trafficking programs or working with individuals who are put at higher risk of future exploitation. If they need assistance, financial assistance with getting their fingerprints, um, that's a service that we could potentially provide. I'm happy to, to talk to people on the side about that later. So the FBI background check is, uh, of course, going to be nationwide. Uh, it can be helpful if uh, your client may have, have items showing up that occurred in other states. Um, it is going to be very comprehensive. However, as noted earlier, there can be discrepancies between what's on state records, what's on federal records. If a case in a, has already been expunged at the state level, but it was already in the federal database, uh, it probably will still show up on the federal database because the, the Maryland courts uh, cannot order the federal government to expunge their record of something. Um, but again, because a search is so incomplete now, um, we are basically recommending all sorts of options for how to find out about the existence of other cases that you may be missing by simply looking at case search. And we use a, a, an, um, a service through field print. Um, and just to note, the one thing I do like about the FBI background checks is they're pretty easy to, to access. There are offices all over the city, all over the state that we can, that clients can easily get fingerprints through. Um, you know, they're located like UPSs and, you know, other other providers. Um, so it's actually a pretty easy thing to access, a pretty quick process to go through. Um, and so it's another option. Yeah. And the results for field print, 24 hours they're back. Whereas yeah, it's, it's weeks, very swift. 
it's weeks with the Maryland, um, you know, the Maryland report. So if you have a client who has a criminal record in Maryland, but also potentially in Pennsylvania and, you know, New York, this is going to be a way better bet for you. It's more mm -hmm. kind of more bang for your buck, essentially, literally. Mm -hmm. Or if the client just doesn't remember, I mean, I've had yeah. clients that, you know, they, they don't recall they were being trafficked. They're not sure exactly where incidents happened. Um, and so this is a great way to get a comprehensive look at anything. So just some other avenues for uh, finding records. Um, as I mentioned, there are the, the court case files are still going to be complete. Uh, until an expungement actually is granted. A person could go to the actual physical courthouse and request a record. This is probably the most burdensome option on the list. Um, it can be hard to even figure out which lo courthouse location you wanna go to in different counties. Um, there are different kind of internal rules about where they house certain types of court records. It could be at a central location in the county. It could be at the courthouse where the case was actually heard, et cetera. Um, and you can be waiting around and whatnot. It might be kind of viewed as a last resort option if you really need to figure out uh, what's going on with the case. But it's important to note that that is still something that's available. And it emphasizes the fact that uh, the case is being hidden from case search does not equal expungement. And then I mentioned the kind of other version of case search, uh, which is called MDEC Smart Search. MDEC is the Maryland court's electronic filing system. Most counties use this system now. Uh, the only ones that don't are Baltimore City, Prince George's County, and Montgomery County, um, and of course- Where the majority of our us. clients' cases are. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so not super helpful for <laughs> maybe us and the people on this presentation who may be dealing primarily with Baltimore City cases, um, but it is good to know that this other version of case search does exist and is not affected by this law that is hiding charges from regular case search. Mm -hmm. um, it's not as convenient to use smart search despite the name. Um, it's a little bit harder to sort through by type of case or filter out only criminal cases or even look by date of birth, et cetera. However, if you find the case on there, you can see the complete information that you need. You can see everything, case number, all of the relevant dates, dispositions, charges, etc. cetera. Um, and in some cases, you may even be able to find scans of the actual court documents on there. Uh, theoretically, Baltimore City, PG, and Montgomery County are supposed to be getting on to e-filing at some point in the coming years. So once that happens, um, potentially these cases would be available to be found on there, but we don't really know what that's going to look like yet or when that's going to happen. Hello everyone. And we are back for an unexpected part two of our webinar. Um, my apologies for the break in the presentation. And we had some unexpected technical difficulties that ended up kicking us off of Zoom. So we are back to resume and um, we should be wrapping this up in the next like, 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for again, your interest and um, your willingness to, to stay for part two of, of this presentation. And now I'll hand it off to Chris to continue talking about filing. Okay, so continuing on from where uh, I was speaking uh, before the, the cutoff, um, once all of the cases that are eligible for expungement have been found. Uh, we have some tools that can assist with actually creating and filing the necessary paperwork. MVLS operates this website called mdexpungement.com. 
for any cases that are still to be found on Maryland Case Search, you can use mdexpungement.com and a uh, Google Chrome plugin as well to uh, find the case number of the case and sort of analyze the case and, and uh, give you a suggestion as to whether or not it can be expunged. Um, and for those cases that can be expunged, it will generate the legal forms necessary. It will fill in the blanks essentially in the expungement form that the courts uh, have created. Uh, I like to think of the expungement tool as primarily a way of generating the legal forms. Um, I don't like to think of it as a substitute for legal analysis. Um, it is a computer program. It's not a substitute for an attorney's analysis, uh, but it does make suggestions as to what can and cannot be expunged, uh, but it shouldn't be relied upon as 100% accurate, but it's an extremely helpful guide. Um, and again, this is now going to work pretty much only for cases that are still on Maryland Case Search. For those cases that you may find on a background check like fingerprint or the smart search or elsewhere, uh, you will need to fill out the forms manually. And at mvls.org, we do have links to the court forums and other resources like this that I'm mentioning. So filing expungement is free if it is for a case that's not a conviction. Ordinarily, $30 to file for a case where there is a guilty finding. However, MVLS clients and other uh, legal services providers are able to get that fee automatically waived by nature of being a nonprofit. And for filing expungements, uh, any case that's eligible for expungement can be filed at any time that it is eligible. You don't have to worry about putting every eligible case in a single petition or having like one shot at expungement. Um, if other additional cases get found after the fact, uh, those can always be filed later. So the actual kind of legal procedure for once something gets filed, according to the actual letter of the law, um, the state's attorney has a 30 day window to object to the expungement. They can really only object if something is incorrect or something makes it ineligible. Um, generally, especially if you've had an attorney determine eligibility there's not really going to be any issues. Uh, the state's attorney would normally object if maybe there was a subsequent conviction that you missed in your analysis, or maybe the defendant or petitioner um, has a new pending criminal charge that would prevent filing expungement that you weren't aware of at the time of filing. But other than that, generally, uh, there shouldn't be an objection. Um, once the window has passed, uh, the court should grant the expungement. Um, the courts are supposed to grant the expungement if there's no objection. Uh, it can actually end up taking several months, um, four to seven months in Baltimore City. And uh, at the time of this presentation, uh, with the pandemic still ongoing, it can be a little bit unpredictable as far as how long this process is going to take. The courts are generally supposed to issue a date stamped copy of your petition to as proof of filing. Um, that can take a long time as well, and it may not actually happen uh, just with the uh, chaos that's kind of still going on in the world. Things are a little bit disorganized, but after the court actually grants the expungement, there will be a expungement order signed by a judge and that will go out to the filer um, and usually the filer's attorney as well. And obviously you'll want to keep that in a safe place as proof of the granting of the expungement. What the order actually does is it gets served on all of the different 
record keeping agencies that we've been discussing, like the police, the state's attorney, et cetera. And once they receive that order, they are required to expunge all records of the case that they have in their possession within 60 days. Um, the case search uh, results should be removed uh, pretty shortly after the order goes in as well, but it is important to check case search. If the case was one that was already on case search to begin with, you should check to make sure it's actually been removed. Um, occasionally, you may have to follow up with the court if it's been you know, a few weeks and it still hasn't come off. And then you may even want to go ahead and get a fingerprint report, you know, maybe a month or two after you get the expungement orders to make sure that everything really did get expunged. And then that also can serve as a good definitive way of showing these cases are not on my record if they were to somehow be uncovered elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Chris, um, first of all, everyone, thanks for joining us again. Pay no attention to the fact that my outfit and location and jewelry have all changed um, <laughs> since the last time I saw you about two or three hours ago. Um, Chris, you know, you actually make a really good point about the, the new CGIS report. Obviously, it's, it's a way to check your work, but it's something that's really important for service providers to understand who are kind of supporting a client through this is um, I've worked with clients who assume that, you know, once it's off a case search, it's gone. So they, if they go and get fingers, so if you're, you know, so today I get the expungement order, I look online, it's off of case search. And I, if I go get fingerprinted today, it's probably still gonna be on my fingerprint record. Yeah. So it's really important um, as, a, as, a, as a way to kind of lend some predictability to the process and also to not set any unreasonable um, expectations to help folks know that even though it's off of case search and you have that court order, it takes some time for things to catch up throughout each of the systems. Because mm -hmm. again, um, you know, case search is one piece, but the police department has a piece of the case. The state's attorney has a piece of the case. Um, the court itself has, you know, the entirety of the records. Um, and it, it's really important to set expectations that it takes time for all those pieces to catch up. And getting fingerprinted right after an expungement order is issued is probably not going to be successful in quite the way that the, that the client is hoping. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly with COVID still going on, um, you know, things took longer, I think, than the, the standard uh, or the what was required by the law anyways. And now this has gotten pushed back. I mean, I know I'm still getting certifications of compliance from agencies sometimes over a year, if you get the, or the certification at all, after the expungement order has been entered. So it's going to take time and just being setting those expectations for clients is very, very Okay, so very quickly, uh, we did allude to this toward the beginning of the presentation, but if a record has been expunged, um, a person may not disclose uh, the existence of that arrest or that case um, on employment applications, um, and that goes for convictions as well. Um, and in fact, employers may not um, terminate someone or refuse to hire someone based on the person's choice to not disclose expunged records. Um, in rare circumstances, some types of employers could have access to cases that have been expunged, um, like military or high security clearance types of employers, uh, as we mentioned, sometimes federal databases could have records that were expunged at the state level. Um, but in general, having a case expunged is going to be the protection that you're seeking from uh, having to discuss that on a job application. Yeah, this is a really good place for service providers to, to um, think about doing some advocacy work with your client in terms of how to talk about criminal records and how to frame things in such a way that helps 
um, you know, combat some of the stereotypes that, that exist around people with criminal records, stereotypes that exist around criminal records of different types, um, and, you know, doing role plays, uh, writing down how you're going to discuss things ahead of time and prepping a client for those potential disclosures um, can be, uh, you know, is something very concrete that service providers can do with their clients and also, again, lend some predictability and some, um, you know, a sense of control to what, as you hopefully have clearly seen, can be a very out of control process. And so that, that preparation um, can be really crucial, crucial in uh, helping folks get ready for uh, employment uh, applications and interviews and, you know, housing interviews and things of that, things of that nature. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for joining us today and for giving, you know, this great update for our audience. I know advocates across the state are really going to appreciate hopefully having a deeper understanding of what is a very confusing process and some confusing changes that have rolled out in the past um, year and that will continue rolling out once October hits. Um, I, I think one thing we've been trying to hammer home throughout this entire presentation though is given how confusing the landscape is, it really is important if your client is able or if you are able to reach out and get some legal help with criminal record relief and with things like expungement. And there are a lot of service providers out there around the state that can help with these. We just put a few up here. Of course, the Human Trafficking Prevention Project, we specialize in criminal record relief. Um, you can make referrals or request help through our website or reaching out to myself or to Jess. Um, Maryland Volunteer Lawyer Service has an intake line open Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to noon, which anyone can reach out to. We are an income-based organization, but um, if we aren't able to help, we can definitely provide referrals to other legal resources. The Office of the Public Defender is also there as a resource with criminal record relief, particularly if someone's already um, represented by the Office of the Public Defender on a criminal matter. And Maryland Legal Aid does so much work around um, expungements around the state and has lots of clinics and, yeah. you know, works with and libraries. just to highlight as far as OPD is concerned, it doesn't, mm -hmm. you don't have to currently be represented. Oh, Heather, you froze up. I'm sorry. I thought you were. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, my apologies. All I said was, you don't have to currently be represented by the OPD, just if you have been in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we go, we did want to just give Chris a chance to talk just for a minute or two about his program. Um, for many of you, you know, working at organizations where there might be interest in connecting with MVLS, not just through our work um, around supporting survivors of human trafficking, um, but also in just general, um, for just general work and work, workforce development programmatic work. Um, I wanted to give Chris a minute to talk about what he's doing. Yeah, thank you. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, I manage what is called the workforce development program at MVLS. So that means I manage a partnership with a number of job training sites in Baltimore. Um, these are all nonprofit facilities in the city that uh, provide free job training and all sorts of wraparound services, adult education, um, you know, life skills training, uh, access to behavioral health, child care, and all sorts of other services. Um, and we kind of come in as one of those supplemental services to the job training programs and are able to do legal consultations uh, with everyone as they enter uh, their job training courses. And um, right now we actually are uh, able to expand a little bit. So we're talking to other community partners about how we can assist and provide the help that we've been providing uh, so I'd be happy to speak with anyone about the program if, if you're interested. Great, and we have Chris's information at the end of the PowerPoint. So you can, I would encourage you to reach out to him if your organization might be interested in learning more, potentially partnering with, with this great program that MBLS has. So thank you again, Chris, we really appreciate it. Um, just a few final wrap up points. So as you know, um, we do have, a website and outreach materials available to help raise awareness about human trafficking and about 
the challenges that individuals who are made vulnerable to future exploitation might face due to involvement with the criminal justice system. So please reach out to us, check out our website, make referrals. Um, and if you'd like to request some outreach materials, including contact cards, brochures, or posters for your organization, you can um, contact us at the email here on the screen. Um, you can also follow MVLS on social media. And um, we do do a lot of trainings, um, on numerous trainings every month, and they're all free um, and can help you stay informed on some interesting issues around social justice, legal access um, you know, to services, um, addressing criminal records, um, housing rights, all, a whole gamut of things. So we hope you'll follow us and check out um, mvls.org slash events for more information on upcoming trainings and clinics. And this is just a quick list of a few of the upcoming trainings we do have. Um, we'll be talking about, as we do every fall, legislative updates. And this is kind of a legislative update light with <laughs> focus on criminal record relief. But we'll be talking about some of the other substantive changes that are happening um, due to passage of recent bills at the Maryland General Assembly. Um, and then, you know, again, topics are so as diverse as tax, liens and levies, um, and, and some things I don't, even, <laughs> I don't even know what the topics are, which is awesome. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much. Here's our contact information. We hope you'll reach out and look forward to having many of you join us for our next quarterly HDPP webinar. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.